so it's about formation of everything which we look in in astronomy. So even if you not exactly cosmologists, you actually without knowing that you are cosmo how as uh, ISM works, in order to know how galaxies form and so on. We talk to particle physics, we talk to people in in, uh, in star formation. This is a very important field covering lots of lots of ground. Uh, and there's another unique status of uh, that uh, standard cosmology, uh, like a uh, standard model in uh, in a particle physics. Uh, now it's actually basically being fixed. So uh, for the last five years, there was not much of a change in a general kind of a background and a layout of the series. So we have a the standard cosmological model. So let's have a look at this one. This is a, a dark matter distribution uh, in 20 megaparsec radius. Uh, in a high resolution simulation. And you can see lots of kind of different structures. Uh, and looking at those, you start to get an idea that actually is quite complex. Can I describe it in a simple term? But nevertheless, we could do some a bit of a testing of that, but that just doing basic statistics. So looking at that object, for example, that could be a galaxy like our Milky Way. That will be a group of galaxies. That one, a big circle here, uh, equivalent of uh, uh, Virgo cluster. Uh, that's a big object. Start to look inside. You start to look at something which we in the cosmological substructure, but actually will be galaxies inside the cluster of galaxies. It's quite elongated, just like as observed in real clusters of galaxies. We could count all these different objects. We're looking at the dark matter, but it's remarkably complex. At the same time, looking at this one and knowing from observations that every galaxy has a dark matter, is a lump of dark matter. We associate lumps of dark matter to galaxies. Those should host galaxies. Uh, it's still a long way to go from dark matter in a parameter dark matter to real luminous galaxies. But nevertheless, it's a very close association between one and another one. So now looking at this one, we have tests right, right away. We could count all these different objects. How many? Different masses, a different redshift, if we want ten. Simply mass function, velocity function, different statistics of basics. Now, if we were to look inside of this, uh, those objects, we could count how many satellites will be inside. So this is another test. The profile, the distribution of mass inside those objects will be another one. So all this stuff, and as it was, it's through universe, a different nature. This is all basis of testing of the cosmological model. Uh, uh, the cosmology now is, is a big field. There's a different directions of, 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 of research. One of those is the fixing parameters of cosmological model, and it's still ongoing and very significant effort in that direction. But let's suppose we know those. We actually, we know those will be quite accurate, as, as opposed to a few years ago. There is a very dramatic in, uh, uh, improvement in accuracy of cosmological parameters. But let's suppose we know that. What do we predict and how we test that? Is it compatible with what we see in the universe? It's a different kind of levels of a testing. The one if anything is connected in observations more or less directly with dark matter, we could test it very reliably. Uh, the problem is, of course, not so many of those statistics. What we see in, uh, in the universe is actually light. So it's very difficult to get all the way through all the testing without going to the next step, saying what will be uh, distribution of light. Uh, there is a very simple test, a very simple prescription, how to connect uh, dark matter and a galaxy. In this way, we actually gave up on some knowledge and some prediction, which we later on should recall. But once we uh, gave up on this one, we start to get lots of lots of statistics, lots of tests. And this is this one. Very simple prescription. And looking at all these all this movies, rotating all these objects, and, and uh, uh, giving all these statistics, uh, the biggest galaxy should be sitting in the biggest object. The second biggest galaxy should be sitting in the second biggest object, and so on. It's called halo bandits matching. You match observed galaxies with, the, uh, with what we see in, uh, uh, in the simulations and the, the theoretical predictions. Uh, and we have a nice match between uh, uh, luminous material uh, and a dark matter. Of course, in this case, we gave up on some observational statistics. We cannot really predict luminosity function if we use a luminosity function. But at the same time, we place those in a different object, as those objects of a right, uh, uh, right quantity, right parameters, right distribution, creation function will be one of the statistics, for example, the properties of those objects. So we get lots of, lots of testing doing that, and you'll see later on how that works. Of course, ultimately, that's what we will need to do. We need to know how galaxies, 
how luminosity, how stars are forming uh, in expanding universe. And it's a big deal. Most of development in that direction, uh, in cosmology going in that direction. We need to know how galaxies actually form. But it's a very, very difficult kind of field, as you might possibly imagine. Uh, so as a result, so far, this is not a test uh, for cosmology. This will be development later on indicates, I hope I will see that coming through, uh, and uh, uh, then we will, we will actually learn how galaxies in cosmology work and how they compare with the, uh, the, with the observed galaxies. But it's a few for future. Now, those tests will be for now. What are the examples when actually could directly, more or less directly test cosmology with dark matter? There's a few examples. Lensing in clusters of galaxies. The sense is only the total distribution of material along line of sight, total mass. So using lensing, we know how much material is there, and we could actually check this in observations and, and simulations, and this is what we're we'll going to use as a test of cosmology. Uh, dynamics of satellites, every dynamic, dynamical quantity, uh, is prop of the total mass. So that, in this case, when we, do, uh, when we study velocities and distribution of, uh, uh, of velocities in different objects, uh, that will be more or less direct test for, for cosmology. Another one, just an example, uh, is some features uh, in primordial spectrum, baryonic oscillations, uh, baryonic acoustic oscillations, this is the one gives you scale, on physical grounds you know what is that would be, and afterwards you go to observations and simulations and start to compare those. That's another one. That's more or less direct test uh, for cosmology without going to luminous material. Uh, so now, what kind of quantities we need to get from, uh, uh, from the theory, and I will test those and compare with observations. There is a different kind of basic properties. It's just simply statistics of abundance of different structures at different redshifts. Those will be abundance of halos, the abundance of satellites, with different masses, with different redshifts. It's only a very big field. Clustering of different objects is another one. We'll start with those ones. Uh, and a density profile. Density profiles is a very basic prediction uh, from cosmology. Uh, we've been fighting with those for a very long period of time, uh, and unfortunately, they come up the same way. Uh, so cosmology predicts the cosmic profiles, the dark matter in a single part of objects, start to diverge. Uh, those with R minus 1 explode, so the amount of density in the single part is quite substantial. But that's only in embodied simulations, in gravity-only simulations. When you go to more realistic cases, that actually will be not exactly the case. In the recent development, was a significant effort in this one, uh, how that changes when you go to more realistic setup when you have a, uh, the star formation in the very one. But let's have a look. We go with clustering. Clustering on a relatively small scale from 100 kiloparsecs to 10 megaparsecs, what we see here. This is observation. That's correlation function. It's projected correlation function, but it doesn't matter. It's a correlation function. It's a function of distance from 100 kiloparsecs to tens of megaparsecs. It's a relatively small scale to what we're talking about. Uh, those observational data, this is a, uh, the cut uh, in, uh, in flow. Uh, the correlation function is a nearly power loss. The power loss here, the slope of power loss about minus 1.8. Didn't change much for the last 25 years. If you go back to people's book, uh, it's the same. The slope is minus 1.8. What we learned actually later on that actually is not exactly power law, and it's very important. This is the, the, the bottom plot, the deviation of a correlation function of galaxy uh, from the power law, and you see some kind of a features here. You look now at the, at the, at the, at the, uh, uh, the correlation function, uh, we actually start to learn something. That part of the branch, before that kind of a knee, uh, is coming uh, from the same halo. That's called one halo term, when a, we're counting satellites of the same halo. Like in our Milky Way, that will count in our Milky Way and uh, uh, Magellanic Cloud. Those counts of pairs coming from interior parts uh, of the same halo. The outer part is coming from another kind of a physics. That's when uh, one object will be in one halo, another will be another halo. This is why it's called uh, two halo terms. And you see they're actually quite different. So what we're testing here that the distribution of dark matter inside the same shell. What we're testing here is basically cosmology. The shape of that correlation function here depends on omega matter. So testing that correlation function here, we're testing basic cosmology, testing that part of correlation function, we're testing number of effects 
of formation of galaxies inside their planets. So this is the observation. This is what Sirius did. It's actually more complex than that, but let's have a look at what happened here. What I'm plotting here is the correlation function multiplied by that power law 1, 1, 1 1.8. So if you do the pure power law, which is kind of observed it in tables kind of 25 years ago, uh, that will be a straight line. And what's remarkable after all these 30 years, it's still almost a straight line. Look at this one from 100, I'm sorry, from 100 kiloparsec and all the way up to 10, 10 megaparsec. It's basically flat, basically the same, the same term. And afterwards, we start to see up term here. So this will be one hello term. This one will be two hello terms. So we start to see the up term, just like what we see in, uh, uh, in, in observation. Now, we cannot really fiddle with that. We cannot really diminish that part of this one. It's just basic prediction. We start with it. So now we go to a larger scale. Uh, the correlation function goes down. Uh, there's another term here, which is the Brenic acoustic oscillation. That's due to the motion of uh, 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 propagation of acoustic waves uh, at the moment of recombination. The feature which will be here, we'll observe it and we'll measure it. The next one will be zero crossing. Uh, with the spectrum which is coming from inflation, that must happen. At some scale, the relation function should go negative. So that part here is a negative relation function. Well studied here. This one will be measured. I will, I will show you later on in some results. And this one is baryonic oscillation. This one of the big projects with the Sloan. Uh, and this, this still is still coming because we need to have a, a bigger data uh, and a more reliable data just to check that basic prediction of correlation function in larger scale. Uh, so how that compares with the theoretical prediction? Uh, so this is a, a Sloan result, red chip 0 0.1, uh, slotted by different absolute magnitude uh, in, uh, in, in our band. Those were the observation data points. It will be the points which will be here. Uh, and the hello matching result from the theoretical prediction will be the full line. Uh, what's remarkable is the, about this kind of a, a, a of the testing, it doesn't have any three parameters, which is uh, unusual for any theoretical kind of uh, work if you think about it. There's no freedom here. There's the freedom of prescription, but the prescription is based on the physics of the web. The physics is such that we assume that biggest and the brightest. That's our physics. And afterwards, for everything else, it's just simply testing the given observation. Uh, and it's quite remarkable. Look at this one. So there's some problems, so you can look at this one. There's some deviation. There's some deviations also will be here. But those are small. This is another work done in the same way. In this case, the Sloan is slighted not by, uh, by absolute magnitude, but slighted by stellar mass. And the fits is actually slightly better. Uh, this will be a logarithm of the stellar mass. Uh, uh, in those units, uh, that's a stellar mass of our Milky Way. Again. Very, very nice, uh, very good fit. I know that on those scales, you start to see some deviations, and there should be, because uh, I run that simulation, I know there is some kind of a defect on the large scales in that simulation. We need to rerun it, and we're waiting for new results, which will be coming from Planck, to see how cosmological parameter will change, and we do that. But overall, it's a remarkably good kind of fit. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not a fit. I don't know, we, in English, we don't even have a word for that kind of thing. Match. Because there is no fit in here. Uh, going to bigger scales and slightly bigger ratios. That's a boss baryonic oscillation survey project. Uh, Richard 0.5. Uh, uh, overall, there's a quarter million of galaxies now involved in, this, uh, in, in, in that survey. And we're looking at the biggest galaxies in the universe. So each one uh, will be hosted by a galaxy of a mass about 10 times bigger than our Milky Way. Uh, and that's will be correlation function. There's the two correlation functions which come in from those surveys. This is called the relative space correlation function, which is actually a convolution of a two effect. One is real clustering, probability to find another galaxy given distance, and plus the loss is along the line of sight. Because in this case, when in relative, what relative space means, that uh, we don't know the distance of that object. We know delta z of those two objects when they count, count pair. And we associate it with simple Hubble. Of course, it's not Hubble in those scales. We will be clearly lost. This convolution of a real uh, 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 correlation function plus peculiar loss of one line of sight. We're testing both dynamics and clustering. Uh, and this is how it goes again. Uh, from half megaparsec to about half, about 100 megaparsec, this is how model matches observation. 
This one, another one, is a projected correlation function from the same database. Uh, when we simply count how many objects with the given separation on the sky, that will be that correlation function. So it doesn't have the losses, particular the losses involved. So it's a different physical quantity, but it's on the same kind of, a, uh, of the same brand. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult to see the differences because the match is actually quite remarkable. Looking at the, at the large scale, this is where you start to see some kind of deviations within the HOB here. And there's some deviations which you, which, which you hear on a scale of about 10%. Uh, and there's some mismatch on a smaller scale. But those are small kind of things. We probably know what's happened uh, and we need to improve our modeling. Uh, that is that tell is likely a wrong cosmology because that assumes omega matter 0 0.27. Uh, and the results are pointing to omega matter 0 0.29. I don't know what's percentage-wise, how accurate is all this stuff, but it's kind of accuracy of uh, all this kind of uh, procedure. But overall, looking from that, the testing is remarkably good. Without pickling of anything, without assuming any free parameters, we recover correlation function really, really accurate. There's some deviations, we love those deviations because in this case we could apply for more funding, asking for improving all these all this prescriptions. But overall, the standard model is actually very, very accurate. So going to larger scales, we go to variant oscillation the feature that will be in the power spectrum, those visits here, uh, that will be correlation function. Again, the physics of that event is well known, well understood, well before the whole project even came through. Uh, now, this will be, uh, this is uh, uh, the measurement. Now, for each measurement, we estimate that, that radius, that given redshift, and we cast it in a different kind of a language, which will be here, this one in the example. The distance to that object, we know a quarter redshift that happens. Uh, we know it's angular size, and we put here as a function of distance, uh, so it will be this one, in the units of uh, acoustic radius uh, at the moment of recombination, which will be this one. And now, this is different observational data. The Syria is a blank here. And those were the observations. This is uh, from uh, uh, from low redshift to redshift 0 0.3. That's uh, illuminous red galaxies. In other words, we're going to both redshift one half and then uh, Beagle Z. It's another survey of the same kind. And this way we stand. Again, there was no feeling with that. And we would love to see deviations, but of course we don't see much. Now going to the smaller scales or the different physical events, that will be uh, density profiles, which is a clearly predict uh, relatively robust, so to speak. The density should incline, should increase in the central part, roughly speaking, it's proportional to the distance of the center. Uh, and it's one of the most kind of a complicated and difficult kind of prediction. Uh, there was a lot of work trying to prove that actually not case, not the case, uh, and so on and on. At the end of the day, the, the theoretical prediction stands uh, with some accuracy. Now we could test it. Uh, the testing also was very difficult. Uh, there's a lens in the pants, uh, uh, weak and strong lens in, in a cluster of galaxies. Um, and uh, recently results start to converge into some kind of a pattern. Uh, this is one of the examples. You know, plus 2261, I don't remember its ratio, it's something like 0 0.2. Uh, uh, this is what observations give us, which is the field. Uh, the contours here, the contours of uh, uh, surface density, there's a sum Features here is just simply projection with just what you're expecting. There's something along the line of sight. Those will be in the red color here. There's a filament that you would observe uh, in, uh, uh, in normal kind of universe. And afterwards, uh, that will be projected mass density, which will be this one. Now we could do the density profile of this one, uh, simply for weak lensing and combining with a strong lensing. We have a density profile of a matter in the class of galaxies. One. And this is it. So the blue one is an alarm and can write with a, which is theoretical prediction, with a, some reasonable choice of parameters, which is theory actually predicts. It predicts some spread of those, uh, those, uh, those parameters, and we'll come to that a bit, a bit later on. But this is overall the, uh, how theory does. So the symbols observation, uh, and the theory, which is this, there's a fitting here, because we don't know what the, exactly what theory would predict for that particular cluster. There's some kind of a spread. Uh, and uh, that, that is hidden here as a concentration parameter. But overall, the density keeps increasing in the central part of the cluster. Uh, and in many other ones. This is uh, rather unique because in cluster of galaxies, uh, we could actually trace it 
with very small distances using all these weak lensing results, very strong lensing results, which is very difficult to do with the galaxies. The galaxies that will be done in different ways, that will be rotation curves and uh, statistics like Kali Fisher lake. Uh, so now we could compare that with the different classes, uh, and uh, that's done by comparing concentration recovered from the density of that material in cluster of galaxies as a function of period mass. The coma cluster will be around, around here, so also big clusters, uh, and those will be different observation results. This one outlined here, but most of them will be sitting in that area, uh, and they look at the distribution of theoretical predictions for concentration that the Prada is all 2011. This is the way they should be, and they sit there. So this is the place where actually everything comes through, theoretical prediction actually comes along with what we see in the sense of distribution of matter in the center part of, uh, of, of, of clusters. Uh, going to smaller scales, the test now uh, is different. Uh, now this will be the scale of about 10 kiloparsec. The 10 kiloparsec scale for galaxies is the maximum circuit velocity. So the theory predicts that relatively re reliably without going to the central part, without uh, going to hydrodynamics, it will not change much. We do some, we do make some corrections for abundance of baryons in the central part, they contribute about 20%. This is a, will be taken account. But overall, this is a very, very robust test by itself. This will be uh, something which we uh, will see later on, uh, which comes from observations, will be tally fish relation with different, uh, uh, different types of galaxies, and also elliptical galaxies. Now let's have a look. This is a tally fish relation, this baryonic tally fish relation. That's done now by a combination of different tools. Hell abundance matches is the one. Again, biggest is the brightest. Now to what, when we do the matching, we match luminosity function. We also match uh, a stellar mass function for, for, uh, for the halos in the same way. So for each halo in simulation, we know its luminosity. We know how much variance is sitting there. But we don't know to which halo to put it. So the test will be not that value because it's taken from observation. It's taken what will be halo which we put in it. So the left one uh, is a tally fish relation. Uh, for in order to make the test, we actually went to all this original data uh, and we've done analysis of tally fish uh, uh, and also we add tally fish uh, 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 distribution and also uh, we added uh, early type galaxies. When we add early type galaxies, which will be here, it's a data which will come in with different kind of uh, statistics, uh, modeling uh, of, uh, of the dynamics of individual galaxies, uh, X-ray emission and all, all this stuff. This is a basic property of, the, of, of those galaxies, not at the central part, because if you take a velocity dispersion in the central part, you go to Faber Jackson relation, which is not really tight. So this is a mass of a significant fraction of that galaxy. And this will be this one. So this will be absolute magnitude, and this will be circular velocity. Uh, this is the observations. To go to very large objects, we start to see a significant fraction of elliptical galaxies. This is all the observational data, and the theory will come with different lines. So now prediction slightly depends what we do with the baryon. It's called the adiabatical contraction. This is the, what is actually preferred theoretically. This is the extreme contraction, which is actually not, not sustainable, just simply on the basis of the physics. So the theory predicts something in between the zone. So all the way down. Note that a tally fish relation doesn't hold as a power law on a small scale, observation. It starts to bend down. If it would not, if it goes this way, you would start to see some kind of contradiction uh, with observation, but it does. So the theory predicts, we do, in theory, we don't know which galaxy it will be. Is it spiral galaxy or elliptical galaxy? This is why the curve here is a total population. So if you look at this one, so it's very able to predict a bit on the right uh, from uh, from the artificial relation. Because in that domain, some fraction of galaxies will be elliptical galaxies, and they are slightly more compact than spiral galaxies. This is why it's kind of here. There was a long debate whether that contradiction, uh, whether that contributes contradiction with the theory or not. Uh, but overall, just like what we saw with the relation function, the fit is actually remarkably good. And the same with the, with the baryonic artificial relation. That's a 10 kiloparsec scale. Uh, so going now to smaller scales, we start to see the bigger issues. Density profiles, now we're going to the scale of about one kiloparsec, give and take, uh, which is measured now 
uh, uh, using the allocation curves of, uh, of uh, drop variable galaxies. Uh, uh, and uh, there are lots of papers, lots of observational research actually went to those. The galaxy have been observed and measured uh, in one way or another, and we kind of grilled, uh, uh, grilled uh, observers and they do it right on what the what effect will be. And for like for five years, there was a stalemate. This is a basically summary of, of, of the state. This is the rotation curve of NGC 6822, uh, which is a half megaparticle away from our Milky Way, it's a member of our local group. Uh, it's a Magellanic type galaxy, the same as, uh, as, uh, as LMC, just simply a bit further away. Uh, that's rotation curve. Uh, and that's what the theoretical prediction would be. So now, when you do theoretical prediction, again, we don't know exactly how to place the halo uh, for, that, uh, for that object. You can see that part, in this case, you, you need the peripheral part. You can see that part, you need the central part. This is cast and core, pro, uh, cast and core problem. Uh, so in the central part, there is a way too much of a dark matter. Know that actually it's not a big deal, so to speak. Not a big deal because it actually doesn't really, it's not a big factor. But the problem is it's persistent. There's another example which is here. This assembly of the different galaxies which are listed here. This is what these their profiles normalized in some way. This is again the circular velocity curve, which is, which is here. In the theoretical prediction of a dark matter, we're going this way. This is the disagreement we will have. It's about a factor of two in the circular velocity of those two. Uh, the problem is uh, it's very difficult to handle that. If that curve will be here, I will bring in more, more variants in the central part, stars and gas and so on. It will keep get in accordance with observation. Once we have too much, that's a very difficult one. So that will be there was a cast and core problem. But it shows up on a small scale. We saw that the same cat, density profile of a material in a cluster of galaxies, which is a much bigger scale and an event, actually didn't have that problem. But this problem shows up on a small scale. The same kind of a problem shows also not only for dwarf irregulars, but now recently was discovered dwarf, uh, dwarf spheroidal galaxies, which is slightly smaller scale. So what was the answer? The answer, uh, at least a partial solution of, uh, of that one, was related with the star formation of those galaxies, which is actually very difficult to actually get. Uh, the problem is when you do the simulation, when you do normal kind of a feedback. Feedback in that language is the how stars affect in the environment. Uh, if we include only supernova as a form of, uh, of a feedback, how energy is put back, the star formation rate in the galaxies will, will look something like that. There's a, some spike, but nevertheless, it is fixed very high at the high redshift. And also it slows down and it goes down. So most of the gas converted uh, is converted into stars at the high redshift, redshift 5, 3, and so on. And the result will be very concentrated material in the central part, and uh, the galaxy does look good. Uh, and you study what's the distribution of a matter in, uh, uh, in that type of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of models. It's even more compressed, so to speak, in the central part. When the baryons start to move in, dark matter falls in, it is getting even stronger. So the result was that for a long period of time, we couldn't get out of it. So the recent kind of a twist in this one uh, is, uh, uh, is playing with the, uh, and using and learning how ISM works. Uh, and we improved that understanding. Uh, so one of the key issues was uh, uh, how young stellar clusters actually operate and how much energy they put back into the external medium. Once we start to include that, at least in some, in some way, the star formation history of that of galaxy changes dramatically. Now it's different than the scale. So one mass per year, this will be two, this is zero point, much lower, and it's much dirty. So the constant in explosions in the central part of the galaxy uh, will crash, will move dark matter, and as a result, dark matter starts to flatten out. The density will go down, uh, and that's kind of illustrated in that one. The density initially was increasing, like in about black and white. After all this explosion happened, the density will go down quite substantially. That requires very extreme kind of uh, the formation of ISM or function of ISM, which is illustrated here. Time goes on, two billion years, and the gas, mass of a gas in the central region. If you take, for example, let's take uh, red, and blue this one, the mass of the gas. Very, very quite substantially in the center part. 
to go to green, which is normally always can it see for hundred uh, parsec, uh, and which is the scale of when we start to get a problem with rotation curves of galaxies, uh, the mass varies quite substantially a lot. What happens is the gas comes in, uh, and as there's a threshold of star formation, if density of the gas is not enough, uh, molecular gas is not formed. When gas density is sit some level, that material starts to be available for star formation, and we start to do explosion. So young star clusters will be formed, and this is what drives the mass back, you see going up and going down by a factor of about 10. When that feedback, very strong feedback from young star cluster, removes the gas, mass in the center part fluctuates a lot. And the dark matter now start to get, start to feel that through different processes. Mostly it will be dynamical friction for all this clumpy material. The energy is being dumped uh, in, into dark matter and it's slightly expanded. So there's a current kind of a explanation for car, car, uh, the cusp and core problems uh, in the both regular galaxies. Another problem with the kind of kind of related with, the, uh, with that stuff, again, it's a scale of about one kiloparsec, but manifestation is different. The abundance of uh, those small lumps. We just saw the, the, that, uh, that animation, which just simply counts all these different objects. Now, in, the, in order to do that, and that scale actually, there's a heck of simulations which we need to do, and we've done it many times. Uh, this is now comparison of a number of, uh, 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 of a satellites in our local group. That axis, for each one, we don't use, build, uh, we don't use absolute magnitude or stellar masses because we don't know how exactly to, to, to predict it. We use the circular rods. So on that scale, 50 kilometers per second, that's our Villani cloud. And we have two of those sitting on our Milky Way, which is what it is. In other words, we count all this, uh, uh, all this how many uh, uh, dwarf galaxies with given the circular rods which we have uh, uh, in our Milky Way, which keep going up. Uh, and uh, recently, you know, a few years ago, it went somewhat high here. But the problem actually started to get, start to appear already with the 20 kilometers per second. The recent slow results, recent five years ago, uh, didn't bring any more bright satellites. All satellites, the scale of a fornax, both spheroidal, is already there, it's already observed. There's no more discovery there. Uh, discoveries were done with the ultra faint uh, dwarf, which will be, which will be smaller there. And it's a, many more than we, we thought before, but that doesn't really solve the problem which is really here. So depending on what, uh, what model we assume for our Milky Way, and actually this one is more related than this one, this will be the theoretical prediction how many satellites, the dark matter satellites, we should see in our, uh, in our, uh, around our Milky Way. Let me go this way. Actually, two here. One is very good, if you don't see nothing, but actually that. Abundance of a light satellite, like Magellan Cloud, is exactly the right amount. So what happens is it fluctuates, it might change it here, but it's another problem of what of, of the It's actually the series is exactly what is observed. Different tests were done, this is our Milky Way, uh, the slow the results were showing the same. The series predicts really well, uh, abundance of a light satellite, Magellan Cloud, but once you go to smaller ones, it will be in our Milky Way that will be more spheroidal. We start to see some deviation. You go to Fornax cluster, Fornax uh, more spheroidal, this is the power factor of two. And this is a small scale. It's called over abundance problem. Uh, this one uh, is a slightly different kind of a twist of the same story. Uh, in this case, we count galaxies uh, without, uh, around our Milky Way, uh, uh, around our Milky Way, but now spread is about 10 megaparsec around us. A special catalog uh, of people compiled in Karachi uh, 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 group, about 800 galaxies within the distance 10 megaparsec. It's complete down to absolute magnitude mv to minus 10. It's actually a remarkable kind of sample. And we simply do the same kind of stuff. We count how many galaxies are observed. It will be the same. Again, we plot circular velocity curve. How much they rotate, what, are, what kind of random velocities will be there. It will be this one. And now we compare it with the, with the lambda CDM prediction. Again, here is not much of a signal. I could, I added in the, when I'm making that plot, some fraction of baryons which will be sitting in those galaxies, but there is very little we go to dwarf. Dwarfs are devoid of most of the gas, not, not, not much of, of the star. And again, just like what we saw in the previous plot, uh, there is a two kind of effects. One is very good. Look at this one. Bands of galaxies 
It's above Magellanic cloud, just like it's observed. Again, there's no fiddling, there's no even fitting. This is actually observation and simulation side by side. Go below Magellanic cloud, we start to see this problem. In 20 kilometers per second, the difference about factor of 10. Now, that story now is uh, the two kind of uh, uh, sides of it. One, uh, this one. You go to 10 and 20 kilometers per second, those objects shouldn't actually be there. In most of uh, cosmology things, they, they don't exist. Okay, now, the physics here uh, is the following. Uh, if we track evolution of uh, that small object over the history, there's the two periods when uh, uh, will uh, will significant effect what will be observed. One is the ionization. Ionization hit the material, hit the gas. Temperature is not big. You go to 20,000 degrees at most, typically it will be 10,000 degrees Kelvin. So we know the gas will be 10,000 degrees Kelvin, which we normally for all galaxies we ignore because it's small. Not for those galaxies, because those galaxies do have potential well of equivalent of the same width or the same depth. But that will be important for those blobs because they actually will not form. So those, most of them, will not form luminous material, and such they will show up here. The problem is not how to shut them down. The problem is how to keep those. If I change, for example, the power spectrum and the nature of dark matter, there will be no fluctuations with those here. There will be none. Fine, we don't have that problem, but we have a problem that some of them do exist. And galaxies are quite kind of a, uh, difficult to talk to because if you exist, what you do with it, right? So those galaxies are there, they observe it. But some galaxies are extremely small. Some of them 10 kilometers per second, some of them even small. Not in our Milky Way, but actually outside. Galaxies which are normal forming stars, which have end velocities of 5 kilometers per second. So it's not only how to reduce that, but how actually to keep those small ones. But anyway, the physics of ionization and uh, physics of feedback probably is responsible for that part of the curve. The most difficult part actually comes here. 40 kilometers per second, 30 kilometers per second. This is very difficult to handle. Because those are massive ones, massive than those ones. But they're also much smaller than Magellanic Cloud. Uh, so massive enough, they could hold that gas even through ionization. Uh, they should form stars, uh, and we start to see some contradictions on, on this too. So that's not yet fully solved, but it's understood that that part of the curve is probably responsible, kind of, uh, could be accounted for by uh, the, uh, the physics of formation of stars in dwarf galaxies. Now, related with that, with that problem, uh, is, uh, is related with uh, those dwarf galaxies which are too big to be non-luminous and are too small to be overabundant. The problem is called too big to fail. If, it, if you're too small, if your galaxy is small, you could fail. Fail in a sense, I don't know how to call it. Fail in the sense it doesn't produce stars. Not much to see. Those are big ones. Let me show you one, which is actually a problem. The fourth dwarf spheroid. Just as compared with the other dwarf, uh, dwarf elliptical galaxies, you need to see bigger differences. Dwarf spheroid gal galaxies are very unique. They're different bits, they're not the same branch of elliptical and uh, both elliptical galaxies. This is big one. This is how they look like with the physical properties of those galaxies. Okay. Different ones. The loss in dispersion, like for Copernicus, is a 12 kilometers per second line of sight. Limit. It will be typical for all of them. The size is about 500 parsec, 300 parsec. That's a monster in that case. It's a 100 kiloparsec. Whopping 100 kiloparsec. Look at this one. And this is those which present the problem. They don't have much of a dark matter. Uh, they don't have much of a luminous matter. Very little. This is a problem modeling of dynamics of those stars. And those stars. Uh, they have a remarkable kind of a property, and that's uh, their luminosity basically doesn't depend on a mass within some kind of a frame. So you measure that 300 parsec scale, uh, and you don't see much of a bleed. Uh, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the luminosity. Uh, the modeling of those galaxies is very kind of a difficult uh, because you need to know how much mass is there and that relies on a normal 
uh, Jeans equation, if you go to normal Jeans equation, uncertainties will be in the lowest anisotropy. Depending on what we assume about the lowest anisotropy, it will be factor of two one way or another, which was what to be uncertainty for, for the whole field. So later on, what was discovered, there was a special point uh, in, uh, uh, in, in normal modeling uh, of, uh, of uh, elliptical objects. Uh, and uh, that will be, if you take radius which contains half of the light, the mass within that radius uh, doesn't depend on distance. It's just simply created this one. And that was a somewhat a breakthrough because now we narrowed down uh, our constraints. Uh, this is why we sit. Now, for each galaxy, we have now only one point. So that will be part of a rotation curve of that galaxy, part of the rotation curve of this one, but arrow bars now are much smaller. If that will be sitting in that, in that, in that object, they are not compatible with one another one. So now we could cast it in different ways. This is one of those, let's have a look. Uh, so we now, that will be a profile of a density in a, that, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in that simulated uh, dwarf spheroidal. This is the circular velocity, the function of distance in the simulation. And you can do it in different ways, but it doesn't matter. And it's also this observational point. So there should be analog of that curve somewhere around those galaxies. And we don't. That's called too big to fail. We, we have too many of those which are way too compact. The circular velocity way too big, no equivalent of those in observation. Uh, the problem was, in explanation was that, that one, that's considered one of the serious problems, very significant problems in, in the cosmology. Uh, we think the solution of those is in the fact that those simulations are pure in body. In the impure in body, dark matter and gas and all baryons are locked up. They behave the same way. It looks like a pure in body simulation, but actually it's also gas. So the assumption that the gas is locked up with the dark matter. And it's a very significant kind of effect. On those scales, uh, that's not true. Not much of a baryon can start in the present dwarf spheroid, but that's kind of a key. If you look at dwarf irregulars, there is actually the same cosmological fraction in dwarf, uh, uh, of a gas uh, and baryons in dwarf irregulars, just like the whole universe, which is about 20%. The whole prescription or the whole kind of understanding how dwarf spheroids form, they form from dwarf irregulars, and afterwards at some moment, frame pressure wipes out all these, all these baryons, the gas will be gone, and, you, and uh, the disk will tumble, and that produces both spheroids. So once you do that, once you do that, you remove about 20% of mass in the form of gas from those galaxies. This is what's happening. So that will be pure body simulation, the orbitation curve. Once you remove that 20%, it goes down in that direction. The effect is actually remarkably strong. You remove about 20%, but it also effect will be about factor of two. The curve dips in this way. Once variables are removed, the halo expands. As it expands, you do the mathematics, you see that density in the center part goes down and then that curve shifts in that direction. And when that happens, now satellite is much weaker. It has a smaller circle velocity, it gets close to observation, but also it's vulnerable you now to another effect, which is the tidal slipping from, from the pan. The tidal slipping from the pan start to move it even down. This is the one curve. After removing the baryons, this will be the uh, 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 circular velocity curve for dwarf spheroidal in the simulation. When you throw in, like Magellanic Cloud orbits 50 kiloparsecs around us, it's keep orbiting a few billion years. The circular velocity going down. And now it's going through all the main observed satellites. And attention to this one. So the explanation for, uh, for too, too big to fail comes actually not from cosmology, so to speak, not from simulations themselves, but from the physics of gas and, uh, uh, and, and dwarf, dwarf irregular galaxies. Then pressure removing uh, the baryons uh, from, uh, uh, from gas rich dwarf irregulars will produce eventually the object which fits in, in the right domain. Uh, let me skip some stuff, which is of course the most interesting one. Uh, uh, let's, let's do the summary of what, what we see. From 10 kiloparsecs to 100 megaparsecs, the axis with standard lambda CDM, it's actually astounding. We don't have a, in astronomy the theory which lasts a long time uh, with the many people wanting it to fail and actually producing results which is 10% accurate on a big range of scales. At the same time, on a 10% scale, this fails. If you look at the details, there's some deviations about 10%, but it's a very small extent. 
we think that they're related with the cosmological parameters. And uh, in a few days, new cosmological parameters will be announced. Planck is going to announce that on third day. We'll see how this stand. Uh, going to some smaller scales, we continue to see some challenges. There's some kind of problem. We don't know whether that's nature of dark matter which is wrong or our understanding of how ISM and how stars are, are, are functioning in dwarf irregular galaxies. Very likely this is the way it is. Uh, so we come to meetings and we talk to people who are doing ISM, give us kind of input on this one, how that actually happens, and we learn a lot. You might have said it, and I have missed it, but uh, um, but so the, there's this lack of, of dwarf galaxies at, at small masses, right? Yes. But uh, what about the halos? Uh, can can the um, the lensing can the lensing observations tell us about the abundance of halos so that they could be matched uh, and determine? whether there's a lack of um, small mass halos or not, or there's no, no Not that I know of, it's just they're way too small. So there, uh, you know, you can imagine that because the density is diverging, so you know, at, some, at some moment you start to see the cars uh, through strong lensing, but it's way too small. So they can absorb, and big lensing for those is. So really we don't know whether the dark matter itself at those scales is working properly or not? I don't know. Do you know when the Planck cosmological results will be announced? Thursday. 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 Uh, as compared with, with WMF, uh, the omega matter was actually slightly bigger. Uh, because we took our, our kind of uh, constraints and models from WMF, uh, the omega matter was a bit too small. So we start to see that. But uh, look, we already have a, we have a finger on a, on a button. So once, uh, uh, once new parameters come in, we press a button, and simulations start to run right away. Uh, the, the dark matter energy is uh, the error there must be larger than for, excuse me, the, yes, that for the dark energy than the error for dark matter and of course and the error for baryonic matter. Yes. So, no, but baryonic matter is not constrained, not much is constrained by dark matter. I mean, there's some constraints coming, but there's others. The big band nucleus entity is coming. So you are not constraining very much the... It's, uh, it's mostly omega matter. Yeah. Hmm? With the omega total, you are not... No, they, they, they will constrain omega matter, yes. yes. This is the prime kind of. The slope of the power spectrum, that's another one, which is, a, which is very important uh, of, for many things, like amplitude of fluctuations of small scales depends on the slope of the power spectrum, and the physics uh, of, uh, of inflation. So those are kind of parameters, and overall amplitude. I'm not expecting much, but there will be some uh, doubt about it. Do you think that are useful. Sorry, do you think that the globular clusters are useful in this considering what's happening on the smallest scales of? Uh, as far as I know, they don't have any dark matter. Yes, but uh, no. but the stars are as old as uh, as reionization, so maybe they had dark matter before and they the stars got separated. Not that we matter. know of how globular clusters are formed. They're formed from from inside the galaxy. They don't form by themselves. <laughs> Uh, that's actually an interesting kind of a point. If you if you look at the redshift like you know, 10 or something like that, there will be some object which is the size of you know, collapsing 10 to 8 solar masses. You could imagine that those will pull from something which will observe it as a, a, a global cluster at present, but the number of those is very small. Mm -hmm. uh, and all global clusters which we know of don't have that matter. Mm -hmm. But this is some kind of kind of field which is they all can. Do we predict enough global clusters with all this? Uh, or Alec Nedim is working in that kind of in that direction. 